Okay, as people are entering, it's um, a pleasure to welcome you all for another iteration of A Plus D Thursdays. My name is Shannon Jackson. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor of Arts and Design at UC Berkeley and a Hadidi Professor in Arts and Humanities. It's been a privilege to welcome students, um, students of LNS 25, um, who are together with me and um, with GSI is exploring the theme of time-based art throughout the entire semester and to welcome as we do every week, a wider public to engage with many of the artists, curators and critics who are leaders in the field. Uh, we've had, um, if you don't know already, an incredible array of artists and curators, uh, um, including William Kentridge, Steve McQueen, Shireen Nashat, Chrissy Isles, Stuart Comer, Catherine Wood, Adrian Edwards, Isaac Julian, and many, many more. And we have more glorious people ahead. Today, we have um, an incredibly glorious, luminous um, artist, um, uh, Miriam Banani, um, whose practice has become increasingly known for its, um, the inventiveness of its imagery, um, for its political acuity, for its post-colonial futurist themes, as well as for the emotional range from incredible humor to um, very delicate compassion that it uh, the emotional range that it elicits and um, elicits from all of us. Uh, we're allowed to explore the theme of time-based media art because we um, are indebted to uh, the Kramlick Art Foundation whose generous donation has made this entire course and this lecture series possible. The Kramlick Art Foundation uh, founded by Cal alum Pam Kramlick is devoted to education, public programming and research in the field of time-based media art. Um, when we think about what it is to welcome Miriam Banani, who is, thinks deeply about a range of, we could say, post-colonial histories and global themes, including what it might mean to um, reimagine uh, issues of, around uh, location, home, and migration. It's a reson such themes are acutely resonant for us at UC Berkeley as we think, too, about how to reimagine the nature of place and connection. Uh, including um, uh, our relationship to uh, our own fraught histories and the fact that UC Berkeley is sited on the unceded and ancestral land of the Ohlone people and in acknowledging the deep and rich and fraught history of UC Berkeley's connection to the Ohlone tribe as well. We also recognize that uh, the Ohlone people are flourishing um, and engaged members of the Berkeley community and of the Bay Area more widely. When we think then about what it might mean to reimagine our time together, reimagine space together, and to deploy varieties of media, story, uh, and spaces of gathering in order to do so, um, we might be that, mu that much more inspired by the practice of Miriam Banani, whose work has been collected by a range of major, um, major collections and museums around the world. Um, it's been exhibited at venues throughout the world, including um, the Whitney Museum of Art, the Kitchen, as well as in social media venues such as Instagram and Snapchat. Uh, Miriam is indeed um, somebody who is rethinking uh, the nature of media as an art form and as you could say, a delivery system, um, a delivery system for connection and provocation. And with that, um, I'm so looking forward to seeing what forms of connection and provocation she has to offer us today. Miriam, I'm gonna turn the screen over to you. Thanks so much for being here. Um, hi everyone, and thank you so much for such a beautiful intro, Shannon. Um, I did not realize that you had such an amazing lecture series. Now I feel like I wish I had um, attended all the previous ones. Um, so, Thanks for having me. And um, I'm gonna be talking about a specific project today because I found that it's it's nice in the space of a lecture to focus on one thing. And I, I remember being in school, I always liked um, seeing how an artist goes from having an idea to it becoming um, a project um, and like the different steps of that. So I will run you through um, kind of like how I started thinking about this project and then it's different interactions in different um, exhibition spaces. Um, and in general, my approach will be pretty casual. Please think of questions as I go. I, I really wanna have conversations after. 
Um, I find that it's always the best way of communicating anyways. Um, but yeah, I'll start, um, I'll share my screen now. All right, so Party on the Caps. Party on the Caps is a project that I started, um, I would say thinking about at the end of 2000, or the beginning of 2016. Um, and as you know, that's uh, when uh, Trump got elected. Um, and at the time I was actually just kind of like doing research um, and looking into quantum physics because I feel like quantum physics are always talked about as just like extremely complicated, like future of science. And I wanted to understand what it meant on like a basic level, what, it, what are quantum physics? What are some advancements that we like that have been achieved in that field? and uh, more specifically, how that relates to the idea of teleportation. And is teleportation just a sci-fi trope or is it something that we're actually working towards and getting closer to? Um, and so um, I find out that, um, I'll go down here. I found out that actually teleportation was um, not so, so sci-fi, you know, like there has been a few uh, successful, actually three successful tests. Uh, where a photon, a particle of light, has been teleported from a Canary Island to the other Canary Island. Um, and I was thinking, well, if we could do that with a particle of light, I mean, we're a long um, way from doing it with a full human body, which is millions and millions of quantum bits, but maybe one day it will be possible. And so I was, I was just thinking about these different ideas. And with that in mind, also, you know, it was, the, the first thing that happened when Trump got elected is like he passed the Muslim ban. Um, and I am myself, uh, I'm not a resident, you know, I don't have a green card or a passport. I've been doing visas. I have a Moroccan passport. I've been doing visas every two, three years for the past maybe 15 to 16 years of my life. So this idea of, of borders was, I was just thinking about a lot. And with the teleportation in mind, I thought what would happen in the future if teleportation replaces travel by airplane, how will it be regulated? Um, and also will countries like America or European countries, would they freak out about their borders? And would there be some type of new version of ICE? So um, this was kind of like my initial thought. Um, and based on that, I kind of started thinking about what if there was this island in the middle of the Atlantic that belongs to um, the American troopers, which is this kind of like um, new ice officer I, I invented or thought about, um, which not even invented, it's, it's not really far from reality. Um, and thinking that it's like a base in the middle of the Atlantic that is there to teleport, uh, to intercept teleportations from uh, countries um, in Africa to America. And then what would they do once they have intercepted someone who's been teleported, would that person be momentarily, momentarily held on this island? But what if it took so long to figure out um, how to pass new laws around teleportations that this place became a place of its own where diasporas live and are in this in-between state, which is a pretty obvious analogy for the in-between state that is often the case of diasporic living. So those are ideas I had. And then so I, I started drawing um, maps of this island, not knowing so much where I was going to go with the project, um, but following my intuition and imagining. Uh, so you see here, there's like two sides of the ocean and then this big magnetic bubble, like a magnetic field that's there to intercept teleportations. Um, and um, the, 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 the island in the middle. And so this was like where we'd be located. This was a map of the island where there would be different neighborhoods. Um, that's another map of the island. Um, and then I needed a narrator because I was thinking, okay, now I have this island. And my practice usually is that I kind of have a first a documentary approach. So I have in most of my films been interested in specific person or specific subject. And then I go film like a documentary filmmaker. And then I bring that footage back home with me. And that's where something kind of like wrong happens where I stop following the classic um, 
documentary edit that would naturally come to like someone who works in a in film and I start bringing in 3D and special effects to kind of like manufacture my own version of the story uh, or what I feel like maybe has more truth to it because it is, um, I, I manipulate the images so much that I'm not trying to create the illusion that the director is not there and that it's realistic that usually happens in classic documentary. So um, I like to think about this idea that like by really uh, manipulating the footage and being transparent about, about it. I'm kind of like trying to have a more genuine approach to how documentary is a construct. It is subjective and it's very much uh, the result of, of a lot of decisions um, that are made after you film people that have opened up their lives to you. So those are, those are kind of like some things I think about. But with this project having a sci-fi element, I thought, well, Ideally, what I want to do is establish this place, explain what it is, and then inside that place, make a documentary. Um, in order for me to establish the place, I thought I need a classic introduction, like any sci-fi film, um, where someone explains what the place is, what the time is in the future, what's happening, kind of like what I just explained to you. So um, I often have animated, avatars and characters in my work. And that helps me kind of like create a bridge between me and the audience. And here I created a crocodile, her name is Fiona. And the origin of the crocodile narrator um, for this film was that as I was thinking about this, I visited Morocco and um, for some reason, I saw at least five different people walking around in the street with this, um, with like Lacoste tracksuit, with the golden, big golden Lacoste, it's the one you see on the on the bottom left. And I was thinking, oh, it's funny, like Lacoste is like it's such a classic brand, and there's so many bootlegs of Lacoste in Morocco, like and in a lot of different places. Like the the logo is so adaptable; it's so easy to adapt uh, in different ways. And then I was thinking at the same time that I like the idea of in thinking about the, the geography of the island. I don't know if you can see it here, but there's this kind of like dark river that's like pretty thin that goes around the top part of the island. And I had thought, you know, like since I'm, I can create any uh, maps or geography for this island, I wanna think about a narrative, things that will help me um, in storytelling. And I felt like surrounding an island by a swamp is a kind of like, age old cinematic trick to just make a place feel iconic and feel like it's haunted. And that a swamp comes with a swamp monster and urban legends. So I thought maybe there's this big alligator that's a swamp monster that is kind of like an important part of the mythology of the place. And so it all made sense with Lacoste and I thought a crocodile. Um, so those some of my, were some of my inspo and then the logo where you see the buff crocodile, that's my version of the, the Lacoste logo for the Caps um, Island. And I created this brand called Croco. So there's the narrator and there's also the idea that anything on the island is made through this brand called Croco that has that logo. So then I started um, designing the character of the crocodile, uh, the narrator and um, there were like in the bottom, you see some of my inspos and, and, and then on the top with like some initial drawings and she was kind of goofy. Um, but then as I was, um, as I was looking for the perfect voice actor, um, for the crocodile, I found this, um, this woman, uh, who, who lives in Barcelona, but she grew up in Equatorial Guinea and she's a rapper. And, uh, it was just a, someone that. I was friends with on Instagram and she had an amazing speaking voice. Um, so I told her about the project and she was excited about trying out to be the voice. She sent me a few uh, voice memos and then immediately it made so much sense for the character. And so then I finished designing the character of, of the crocodile and I called her Fiona after uh, the real Fiona. And um, I tried to model the crocodile a little bit after her. Um, she has like, she's so charismatic and, and like funny. And so I wanted to kind of like have that essence uh, within the narrator. So now I had like this narrator 
who could tell any story I wanted, and this place, which is also, you know, just like such a perfect starting point for story. Um, when I say story, obviously, you know, I'm creating um, this like parallel version of, of reality, this speculative place to critique reality, to talk about reality. Um, but within it, I wanted to feel like it's a real documentary and it's not science fiction. So um, I'm gonna show you um, a little bit of Fiona in the introduction, uh, who's explaining what's happening. Hello, me to tell you back in the story. Remember when teleportation replaced airplanes? The U.S. government immigration troops intercepted the growing number of the illegal migrants. Finally, in the middle of the teleportation process, in complete quantum mess, this assembly state, which we all know is insanely dangerous. Those who survive and resemble well enough to function were kept in massive camps on triple base setting in the middle of the Atlantic. Yes, you know the island known as the Caps. So, for capsule, no capital. The number of refugees grew faster than I took for this functional U.S. government to make it my about what to do with this new dislocated population. Eventually, the camp grew into neighbor. Um, oh, it stops here because it's just a little, um, a little snippet of like what Fiona does and her function is. Um, so um, when that was done, this is a, a th three minute introduction that kind of establishes the world. Um, I, I still had no idea where I was gonna take the film or the project. Um, and at that time I was working, um, um, I got commissioned by the Biennial of Moving Image um, in Geneva to do an installation. And so I thought this would be a perfect project because I, I was already working on it and I had uh, enough time to, to, um, to kind of finish the film before the, the exhibition. And uh, this was the first time I was given an actual production budget um, for the video part of, of my work. Because since I film and I do special effects, I, I always, I'm in the situation where I just do it all on my own. Um, and then I have uh, financial support to build sculptures. But this was the first time I had some money to think about, you know, scaling up a little bit how I work in terms of the video itself. And I thought, um, what if I, took that money to throw a big party. And the party itself is a party that happens on the caps. Um, I will film it in Morocco because if ultimately this is a documentary about Morocco. Um, and by that, I mean that although it is supposed to take place somewhere else, the people I'm filming are really talking about themselves um, because they, I asked family members to role play but the extent of the role play was that they had to follow a simple rules is to be at the party, to be themselves, but to say that they're on the caps and that we're in the future and to understand the concept. Um, so then I knew I wanted to uh, throw a party at my grandma's house. So this was the house. And then I um, designed in 3D this element just to kind of like be like, this is a classic traditional Moroccan neighborhood how can I, in a simple way, create a feeling that we are in a Moroccan neighborhood, but maybe it's either, either in the future or something is off. And so I created this three floor um, couch, which you'll see later in the video. And then I thought, okay, so what is, what is the party about? What's happening in the party? How can I, in a simple way, kind of bring in the themes that I wanted to talk about through this subject? Um, and, you know, a, bi a big kind of like origin story for the people on the caps is that they were in a state of disassemblement at the quantum level, and they were violently intercepted in that vulnerable state, and then had to reassemble. So there's something traumatic there. There's a violence, which is obviously like just an analogy for border violence. Um, 
And that's how they land on this, in this place and start their life. So the relationship to your body, I think would be very, very different and way more at stake. Uh, the idea of not taking, even having a body, a full body for granted, which you know, takes you uh, kind of like, just kind of questions um, what, your body, what your body can do, uh, gender, age, um, really anything related to your body. And I also imagine this is a place, place in the future where biotechs has made a lot of progress and you can't never um, kind of like trust someone's age by how they look. Um, so I thought this is the birthday party of a woman who's 80. She was born in Morocco. She has known Morocco, but has been living on the caps and has had kids in, on the caps. And um, for her 80th birthday, as a present, she got an age reversal surgery. So she looks like she's in her 20s. And my cousin, who's in her 20s, is actually going to be playing her role and be the birthday girl. Um, and so those were some inspirations for her makeup, which didn't really make it. Uh, this was how I thought about the idea of baby adults. So seeing um, kids that actually are mini adults. And it was because I saw this Ed Sheeran, this kid who looks exactly like Ed Sheeran somewhere. And I had kept that image. And in the bottom, there's an image from the Caps video where there's like a baby couple. Um, this was the birthday, the birthday girl, my cousin. Um, and so what I did is, you know, I knew I wanted to have this party and there would be so much going on because um, aside from the fact that I asked everyone to wear green so that it would feel like something is a little different than reality and that I asked everyone to just be themselves. Um, it was very, very um, real. And so so much happens at a party and I knew I couldn't capture everything. So what I decided to do is to ask two other people to film with me and I hired the wedding photographer and I had I created a photo booth and I asked them to take photos of people. So as, as the party went. So this is the main, the birthday girl. Um, these are three teenagers who attended the party. Um, this is my mother who plays the main character. So in uh, she's she's in a lot of my videos and she's an amazing actor and always, always very open to playing. It's like it's like asking your whole family to do a big you know, child play. Um, and so her role was that she is organizing the party for her mom whose birthday it is. And so she's uh, on camera more than other people because she's uh, one of the main characters. She's also in real life and on the caps, a pharmacist. So there's a whole sequence where she talks about what it's like to be a pharmacist and be paid in dollars and feeling like she's kind of a trader. Um, and all those things, you know, I give her little prompts but once those prompts uh, are respected, I let her kind of talk about who she actually is today in Morocco. And that's what I mean by it ends up being a documentary. Through the role play, I create a more comfortable environment for documentary. Um, so those are two of my aunts. The one on the right is um, actually does, um, um, is a dermatologist, but specialized in um, a lot of uh, plastic surgery. And so she was also playing herself, being the doctor who performed the age reversals um, operation. And that's an other aunt on the left who's also one of the main characters. This is some of the behind the scene of filming this party. Um, these are scenes from the party. Actually, I'm gonna show you the trailer for the video now. So, um, you know, it's a 30 minute video. You won't get much from a trailer, but I thought, it would be a good time to do that. Remember when teleportation replaced airplanes? Um, 
Okay, so I had this introduction, this party, and then I guess the film um, um, kind of like goes back and forth between these party scenes that kind of reveal um, a lot of elements about the island. And then uh, scenes where you spend more time with some individual characters and they talk about the, the everyday life on the caps. Um, and it goes from this very kind of like festive central events, which I purposefully chose um, to be festive and a party because I felt like a moment of joy was kind of like would be the, the biggest display of resistance in talking about people who are held by American authorities. Um, and going from there to moments that feel maybe a little more emotional or intimate with some of, um, of the characters. Um, I should say also that this is kind of like the first chapter inside a bigger project called kind of called Life on the Caps, which would be a full um, trilogy. Um, and so I'll kind of move a little quicker because I see that um, it's already been almost 30 minutes and I have more things I want to show. But I want to explain a little bit how I work. So um, it's very much a collage. And the idea is, um, and this is in my practice in general, that what I care the most about is, um, is really storytelling. When I say storytelling, I mean that I'm, I'm interested in creating space for emotion um, and kind of accessing people through their emotional intelligence, you know, before bringing them into subjects that maybe um, are kind of like harder to talk about or politically charged. And I, I find that, yeah, like um, as an entry point, emotion through either humor or actually working with people who are opening up to me on camera that I, I, something happens, something is given by me, something is taken by me with them. And you feel that on the camera. I find that it's the kind of like most genuine way to connect. Um, and for that reason, I don't necessarily feel loyal to any genre or way of editing. Um, my videos are kind of like a collage of a lot of different audio, audiovisual languages. So, you know, if one scene is about how someone, how there's tension between two people, and I find that something I've seen, uh, a type of editing I've seen in reality TV would best serve the tension in that scene, I will edit using that language. And then if I need to create a kind of like musical sequence that um, has a completely different goal so that I can lend the emotion that I want, I will borrow from something I saw in cinema and then go to like a wedding video style and then a shaky documentary if that's what feels right. Um, so what leads my decision is really the emotional tension and story and not necessarily any desire of being cohesive. I think this also comes from being Moroccan, which is a place where language is very politically charged. I am French educated, which is a complete uh, result of French colonization. Um, and then there's Darija, which is the Moroccan dialect. But in school, you learn classical Arabic, and there's also Spanish and Berber, different Berber languages. So it's a very complicated place when it comes to language. And I think that it influences my work in kind of like refusing to stick to one and uh, loving what I can get from uh, the back and forth of everything. And so the, the way the collages expresses itself is also in terms of the image making that happens in, in my work. Uh, there's so many kinds of images. For example, the video opens on what you see at the top left, which is um, um, a YouTube video of uh, football, a soccer uh, game in Morocco. And someone sent it to me. I thought it was really beautiful. There's all this smoke. And so I used that. Um, and then in order to move on to the intro with the crocodile, I recreated that stadium in 3D. And then it's kind of just like exists in these two spaces, one that I staged and one that is very shaky and looks very YouTube and real. Um, then for example, here, I needed to have a shot of like the trooper quarters on the island. And I was, um, I filmed Woodhall Hospital in uh, Brooklyn, which is a very famous hospital because it's in like this neighborhood, uh, it's in between Bushwick and bed in Brooklyn. And it's this huge, massive building and it's famously dysfunctional and like famously represents the, the healthcare system in America where it's like, if you get like hurt or something and you, 
someone is like, I'm taking you to Woodhall, you're usually scared. And, um, and so many people I know have been to this hospital. So I filmed that with my iPhone and then added elements on it to make it look like the trooper base. Um, there's a lot of um, live action footage that I filmed that, and that has special effects on it. That's one other kind of kind of collage. Um, so you see the, the neon glasses and the phone that comes out of the eye. Um, and then, yeah, so the type of images are YouTube um, archival live action that has a uh, special effect on it or CGI. So a lot of images were completely made from scratch um, from 3D programs. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about um, the sculptures because that is only half of my work. When I, when I start working on a project and I'm editing the video, I usually um, know where the first iteration of this project is gonna go. And I get floor plans from the exhibition space and make a 3D of those floor plans. And based on that, as I'm editing on the 3D program, I draw sculptures, which I know will become screens um, where I will be projecting different versions of the video to create a multiple channel installation. Um, the way it works is that I usually um, know that there's one, one version of the video that is the master version, which is what you would see if you're seeing a single channel version. And then there's usually five, six, seven, eight other screens in the space where most times you would see kind of the same thing, but oftentimes you have different ideas, different uh, a focus on something else, a detail, a lot of B-roll, mostly with the party scene, you know, feeling like someone is getting a drink here, someone is dancing there, and there's a lot going on. And so what I'm interested in with these installations is to create an experience first that is physical, because again, I'm really interested in the, the kind of like visceral aspect of experiencing art. Um, and so, you know, I'm on the computer all year, just editing and, and, and having access to space for me is so important to really do something out of the space uh, and create an experience that you feel in, in your body and having, you know, be inside of all these screens. Um, but it's also this idea of when you enter, you at first you're overwhelmed because there's screens everywhere. And so you have to be active and alert and kind of develop your own mechanism for watching and understand how to follow the story, which happens pretty quickly. And honestly, we are constantly navigating multiple screens. So it's also this idea of trying to think about the single channel as how it, as um, a format for video and cinema and how maybe it can be challenged uh, based on today's relationship to screen. So this, for example, is a 3D of the space in Geneva where I did the first version of this show. Um, and these were kind of like, um, just like just first drawings of putting a lot of screens in the space. And this, this is not at all final. Um, then this was kind of like the final installation and I'll show you photos later, but I knew I wanted to have um, one screen in the space, uh, the one that says curved screen. I'll show you this one. I wanted to have one screen with bleachers that is kind of like this self-contained screen inside the rest of the installation that would only be there for the three minute animation where Fiona the crocodile explains the island and where you are. And then I knew I wanted you to watch that there and then for that to stop. And then the video itself of the party starting to, to start on the other screens. And so then you have to move from one screen to the rest. And there's a kind of imposed choreography. Yeah. Um, and so those are more details um, of elements. There's this big wraparound screen so on one of them, there's the main version of the video where you see the subtitles, you can follow things. On the other one, there's different things. Um, what you're seeing right now is our, our screenshots from the PDFs that I sent the, the institution at first to start talking about um, the installation. So more details here. I knew I wanted a magnifying glass uh, which using projection mapping with the projector, 
whatever would go behind our magnifying glass would be magnified. It's pretty literal, but you know, it allows me to play with space. And this is also why I like doing these installations because uh, it's part of the collage that I was talking about earlier, where whatever tools I can create to get really close to the emotion that I want to hit at a certain given moment to talk about a, a bigger political issue I will use. And so if space can also help me, um, you know, I'm editing with time, but then if I can also use space as an editing device, why not? Um, I also found through these processes of like making spaces and sculptures for video that I love drawing sculptures. So that's uh, been another element. Then I make these tools. I always design seating. I find that if people can sit and be comfortable, they will watch the video longer. Um, it works, <laughs> but I like thinking about that. I know that I, when I'm watching video and mostly in spaces with a lot of things going on, if I can sit down and focus, I will, I will enjoy it more. And I also like designing seating. So I made these chairs that have light inside of them. And um, when you sit down, you eclipse the light. Um, and they're all, everything had a croco leather which ended up being gray to be a little less literal. So now I'll show you different iterations of this, um, of this exhibition. And uh, the first one is the one that I drew those 3Ds for. So this is the screen I was talking about um, with the bleacher where you watch the intro. Um, and then if you see while the intro is playing in the back, there was a kind of like screensaver happening, which was just like a map of the world and in real time you see the teleportations going as kind of like the type of screen you have in airports. Um, so yeah, and then that's from the back of that bleacher screen that those are scenes of the party. So you see the magnifying glass This is not the most telling photos about what it does but um, what you see in the back, the, the um, not the back, but on the right, the, the screen that is dented, that was kind of like a mac macro version of a lenticular screen where I had this dented screen. And on one side was projected a map of the world with teleportations. On the other side, there was a red light. So you would see the screen, the screen would be revealed as you're walking. So on one side, you see the map, on the other side, you only see the red light. I don't know if that makes sense the magnifying glass. This was um, the second iteration of the show. It traveled in, at OGR in Torino. Um, this one was very similar version of the installation. Um, then this was at Clearing, which is my gallery in Brooklyn uh, in September, 2019. Here, there wasn't one huge space where everything could fit, but I think that was interesting. And that, that's, that's why also I like having work that is just site specific is, for every iteration, I draw a complete new version, as long as I keep the same elements, but I, I can move them around. And so it's, it's a work that really feels very different. So here, that first um, bleacher screen with the intro, I put in the first room, and then you had to go to the second room to see the rest. And the way that we also made that very clear is through sound, having the sound, having speakers um, for one room and the other, and feeling like you hear the sound in the other room once it's time to go there. And it worked pretty well, people would follow. Um, so this is that room you see. Um, and then behind is the bigger room with the video. This was another iteration in 2020 at Julia Stoschek Collection in Berlin. And that was a very difficult space because it's a smaller space, it's a long space, and it has these huge columns in the middle. So I thought that I would include the columns, make one of them a screen um, so that they don't feel like a problem, but a decision. Um, so this one looks very different and more fragmented because I couldn't have all the screens tied to each other because of space. And actually I ended up really liking this fragmented version. I thought it was interesting to have, I wouldn't have done it on my own if I didn't have to kind of think around it. Um, and this is how it looks. That's the column I was talking about. Um, 
it affects so much the story also like when things feel more fragmented. Oh, this is a video walkthrough of um, that face. Popularized by the Caps favorite and only brand of cereal bars. Shake in my heart. All for you, guide and look up. That's it. So um, you'll notice that this, this talk was very focused on kind of like process, like how to like come to ideas, how I put things together. Um, please feel free to ask me question, more questions about that if anything was unclear. I'm also happy to talk more about the ideas behind the videos and anything you want to talk about. Marion, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate Thank you. Going going really deeply into a work. Um, I have questions, especially as we think about um, next week when we start to think about, uh, the students are gonna be thinking more and more about exhibition design. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind, Casey and Edgar, I'm gonna go, I know we're, we have some responses from Casey and Edgar, but I wonder if I could just ask you quickly about the exhibition design practice because it's, um, it's interesting to see how much control you take of, of the space rather than it being say a gallery installer or a curator or some other ex exhibition designer who is manipulating the space. The space itself also seems to be very much something you're manipulating. And you referred, I've heard you, we've heard you referred, referred to the idea of editing with space quite a bit um, in past work too. And I wonder if you could just maybe talk a little bit more about what you mean by that um, and about how much control of space you take. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, um, I don't, there's different kinds of exhibitions, but I don't have most times um, pieces and then a curator helps me decide what goes where. So usually um, there, this is all one piece and um the 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 piece is like you know it, it is it takes over the whole space so for me deciding where something goes is part of my work as as the artist um i guess to answer your question this is why it's not it, it's not even almost like exhibition design it's it's the making of the piece um and that's why every time um it travels to a new space i want to make sure that i have that I'm capable of, you know, like that it will be like a moment where I'm able to like install it almost as if it's for the first time because I, I will redraw everything. And, 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 and for me, the reason for that is that first, you know, um, I think obviously my, my work functions within the art world, but, and, and I have thoughts about the places where I'm showing or like what it means to show in an institutional context and gallery context, but, um, my work is really not about the art world. It's not, it's not a work that's like introspective in that way. Um, so for me, like the, the more you see, the more of the space you see, the more it becomes about what it means to make art. And like, you know, like if you hang a painting, so much is about art and what the history of painting and the history of hanging a painting. And so there is obviously a history of installation, but, but so I like that to create a space where it's not about being in, you forget about that space. It's about taking you somewhere else in a very almost illustrative way. But because of these reasons, um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, it's really fun for me to, that's part of, of my work. And I don't have a studio. I don't work out of a studio. It's again, it's very much like alone on a laptop, 
there's the moment where I shoot, which usually like for the caps, it was three days. So that's like a collaborative moment, but it's very lonely otherwise, you know, it's hours of editing and special effects and animating. And so having the support of the art, you know, being able to do art shows. And for me, like the, the best thing about it is that I get to have the support of fabricators and work with people who know how to make anything. And we can translate these 3D drawings into a space that I can then sit in and experience. And that's one of my favorite part of the process. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, more than answers. But, more okay. than answers. Thank you very much. So Casey and Edgar, I know each of you had some thoughts that you were in the process of um, preparing. Maybe we can go in order before we take, then we'll start taking more questions that are coming in from the audience. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just have a number of, of questions. This is such a rich piece of work um, and it's foregrounded a lot of the themes that we've been thinking about throughout the class, especially um, this discussion of space versus time. We've been talking so much about film and video as media that make use of time. Um, and so you've mm -hmm. done a wonderful job of foregrounding the use of, of space here and how you sort of negotiate bodies moving through the space of the gallery, for example. Um, but the question I wanted to start with is actually about tone and, and humor in your piece. Um, because as you narrated it, this is a piece that was maybe inspired by a certain frustration or anger, thinking about um, the different um, crises of migration um, around 2016. Um, and yet you um, treat this with a lot of sort of vibrancy and humor. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, you, you did mention the role of joy as, as an act of resistance. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that. And then also just about how you um, see the role of humor and playfulness in your work more generally? Mm -hmm. um, first, I want to say that um, I guess like um, for me, like humor or like this kind of more joyous approach of things um, is not always um, a strategy, like a thought out strategy. It's kind of like my default. Or, you know, I think we all have a default of how we approach things. And, and I, I think that is often how I naturally like first enter something. Um, yeah, and, and I find that sometimes it's, it's harder even to like um, approach a pressing, a pressing issue in a joyous way than in a, in a sad way. Um, and I'm also very much working with the, the people who are in my videos. So, um, I mean, it was a party, it wasn't a funeral, but, um, but I, I like a, a lot of my work is in collaboration or in kind of like almost honor of personalities I grew up around that I find so like, you know, are part of this mythology in my brain that I don't see on the media uh, when a Moroccan woman is portrayed necessarily, you know? Um, so I'm not just here to like, do representation you know that's like well, not what I'm trying to say because that doesn't go a long way but it's genuinely who I'm working with and like what they have to say about an issue and how it comes off um that is what makes the video it's like I'm not alone in it um but yeah for me this idea of creating a party was important because I did set this place up that um is politically very charged but um uh, what would make it uh, like what would make me go in different territories are things that I don't know from experience. So I also don't want to go places that I actually don't know. And I want to focus on aspects that I'm interested in talking about based on things that I've genuinely have, uh, have experienced a life or history with. Um, and that is imagining um, in a diasporic situations, the circulation of media, for example, how music circulates, that interests me a lot. Um, in general in the world. And so seeing what would the, the music of the party sound like, how would people talk about um, their attachment to music and relationship to home and the idea of, a, of you know, like a place that you left and, how, and those connections for me were interesting. And that's kind of like where else I put the focus. That's great, thank you. Yeah, and the work is so, um, I mean, it is funny to watch and, and joyous. And I think that um, that really comes across. 
humor yeah. is also survival. I mean, it's not, mm. my choice of humor is never because I, I take things lightly. I'm very serious about what I work, you know, like what I decide to work on. Yeah, and I think it coexists, right? In tension with a lot of the other themes of your work, for sure. Yeah, Edgar, did you wanna ask? Yeah, I, you know, I'm kind of going a little bit along with what we're, um, what you're just sharing, um, Miriam, is th thinking a little bit about um, fantasy and the way that fantasy, um, you know, as you were saying in your presentation, can, creates like a container um, to, mm -hmm. to allow people to role play and, and just thinking about that role um, as a tool, as, a, as like a, a form. Um, I'm just really interested maybe in having you speak a little bit about that, especially as you shared that, you know, that comfort that comes in role play, right? The, uh, be, being mm -hmm. able to maybe share more or parts of mm -hmm. ourselves that maybe we don't share. And then also you were naming, when you think about the installation, you also want you know, that comfort, that ability mm -hmm. to kind of sit with and be, and maybe the possibility that exists when you have that safety and comfort. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, there's like two levels of role play almost. It's like, I found that, you know, I've made all my work in Morocco. All my shows have been um, centered around the video that I shoot either with family members or people in Morocco that I, that I meet. And I, and, you know, like, even though like a lot of people in art spaces um, have been very open, um, I do feel like there's there's always this kind of like so much time I have to spend explaining some or like feeling like covering a cultural specificity before we can even talk about the center of the subject, right? Because maybe I'm making a piece, like I made a piece about two women who are performers and I was interested in the element of performance but they sing a traditional um, Moroccan type of music so so much becomes it's like oh is it about this is it about Morocco is it about this you know what I mean because whenever you talk about a subject um, that is from a place that is not considered the center it, it often you think it's about that place uh, and it's not about the subject itself so I feel like for me kind of like dressing up Morocco as this futuristic island in, that is a caps is already creating a setup where people are less obsessed about, oh, so you're Moroccan and this is about Morocco. I'm like, no, it's this island and this is the Moroccan neighborhood. Um, that's kind of like a role play in itself. And then, then there's the people in the video. First, you know, you're like with family members and you tell them you're in the future and you throw a party, it's funny. It's fun, like it's funny to see how people react to that. Who's a terrible actor and is overdoing it? Who's actually amazing? You know, there's and there's something very, very um, honestly, so fun about having these interactions with an aunt that maybe you would never really connect with because you never see them. You know, so there's something very, I think, touching about that. And I've seen like I filmed a lot of family members at this point, and some that I'm close with, some that I'm not as close to, but. There is something so touching about what happens with the camera. Um, and I think having that first layer of saying, you're in the future um, and you're in a place where, um, I don't know, like you actually came to this birthday party because you wanna see how this woman looked when she was 20, now that she's back to her 20. And it's like, that's the gossip. And then you see people go, but I think it reveals so much about who they actually are. So. It's just, yeah, it's like a container to make things more playful and open them up. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. My pleasure. Thank you, Miriam. We have a few questions um, brewing in the Q&A and also things implicit in, in the chat that um, relate to what you've already started to talk about. but. Um, Maybe just the, an opener question from Kelly Tan, who's saying, where do you draw your inspiration? I, I think that in some ways you already started to answer that. And even in my intro, I was wondering how much do we, how much do you talk about or claim Moroccan or post-colonial identity or those types of themes being active for you versus how much you really want inspiration from different places? Or um, I wonder, you know, uh, you were so secure too in, in how you described um, this project. You said, I knew that I wanted there to be a party. I knew that they, I wanted them to sit here. I knew that they wanted to, I wanted them to do that. But maybe just even a step before that, 
how did you know? How, where did, where did the inspiration come from? Um, you know, as you're, as you're thinking about that. Um, yeah, I think, I think I understand your question and like, um, you know, when you said, um, was cool in your, or like this big, this big, this big, um, things that define other things, right? Like these like general keywords that have been very useful to understand the world we live in and, and, and to like position ourselves. Um, I always tend to question what they are because I'm like, yeah, this is true, right? Morocco was colonized, but, but and this is true that right now there's, there's way more of a platform to talk about it than there used to be a couple of years ago. Um, and that it does, it sounds important. And so I'm always like, it sounds important, but is it important to me genuinely? Or would it be something that would sound legit if I made a work about it? You know, and I think that that distinction is really, really important to me. Is it like, what is a sincere interest? And what is something that feels relevant as like a currency of relevance, you know, um, what's relevant? And, and so that's why I like to start with what sounds like something I genuinely would be so excited to do. Um, because I think that it, with that, if I follow that intuition, you always come back to things that matter to you that are political because you can't escape your political existence. Um, so for example, about the party, you said, how did I think about that? Honestly, like I said, I had a production budget for video and I was like, well, I do everything. So I don't really need um, help unless like I wanna get someone who's better animator or something like that. But it doesn't, I'm like, what if I created a dream scenario to film inside of? And I always film inside of parties when I'm in Morocco but I can't really film anything I want. It was just like, for me, it was like so much fun to create this situation that I know so many interesting interactions happening, but now it's the things that I'm missing that I usually would add in post-production to make it feel like it's part of the world of the video. I can start with those, you know, I can, I can rearrange the living room so that it's better for filming. I can ask everyone to wear green, you know, all this. And so it comes from like, that would be fun. Um, obviously, you know, not head, you know, like, not like reckless fun, but fun uh, within a, an idea of what I'm interested in. Um, yeah. I appreciate what you say too, that like, that you start out with what would be fun, would be generally appealing. And then you know that all the other stuff comes, that all of the other things that in, in terms of, um, you know, whatever might be global themes or apparently relevant themes still will be there. Um, well, the, the, the ones that will be there are the ones that are in the fabric of what happens when all these people meet for a party and what they talk about, the things at stake are political. So yeah, it's like trusting and also not feeling like it has to be politically relevant, but just being like, there's some, there's, I mean, I feel like there's always something interesting when you work with real life. Um, which is why I've, I've been loving, I do animation, but I've been loving rooting it in documentary because it's always things that you would never be able to write or come up with. That was really amazing at the beginning when you started to talk about documentary as sort of um, something that you were influenced by, but resisting at the same time. Uh, Kate, Casey, do you have a, some yeah. thoughts? Well, yeah. well I had, no, I had a follow-up to this question about influences and just thinking about your aesthetic influences because it seems like this is a piece that is very much made by someone, you know, of like the millennial generation, right? Who's sort of grown up with this aesthetic of um, social media, of filters, um, of multiple screens. Um, so I'm wondering to what extent all of that technology, mobile phones, for example, um, things like Instagram filters or Snapchat, to what extent um, you see that as, you know, a language that you're working with? Um, yeah, I think my relationship to, to media and technology is very much one of like that has to do with being a millennial, but I also don't um, give it too much thought in a way, um, because 
I, I really always care about my work being so like having an entry point for everyone. So it's not ageist, like, you know, like um, someone who maybe doesn't have the same relationship to, to uh, social media or something else could also find inspiration in it. It's, it really has to do with that logic I was talking about earlier that really the story is the most important. Um, and if something needs to be beautiful for the story to work better, then I'll make it beautiful. And if something needs to feel like a shaky YouTube video to make you believe that it came from a real place and it hasn't been staged, then, you know, so it really has to do with um, the intention. Um, there was, I mean, this is a sci-fi project. So like whenever there's special effects, they're almost a joke on like a futuristic aesthetic. Like I obviously can't make it look like a rival, you know, but, um, but also do I want to? So yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but often also it's limited to what I'm capable of doing. And certainly something like, right, like home videos, which is another, you know, aesthetic through line of this piece is much older than yeah. all of the social media. So there's clearly many layers of influence. Yeah. There. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I, you know, I really, um, I just wanted to share that I really appreciate like how you're um, in a lot of what you're sharing, you center the emotion, right? The emotional experience um, and also that accessibility. Um, and I think, you know, I guess going with my emotional experience, I'm really like touched by one of the questions in here in the Q&A of uh, someone saying for young artists, it can be hard to imagine how you make or dream of something at this scale of working at pragmatically with, uh, you know, within these multi-channel sculptural installations that were require lots of collaborators and fabrication. How did you yeah. envision going down that path before you had the experience, the trust of institutions to fund these projects? Um, yeah, anything you wanna yeah, share? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question that I completely identify with um, and understand. Um, but I think what I never, these installations, they, they started kind of like happening and like evolving as I was um, growing. Um, it wasn't, I never, it wasn't like I was in, envisioning something and then worked towards it. Um, you know, I, I made pieces and then slowly like uh, the, the scale changed or the, the, the technique changed. Um, the, the first piece I ever made that was kind of like the, the, the origin piece for this type of installation that has become the main language of my work somehow um, was, um, a two channel piece um, and it was uh, these like styrofoam screens that um, what I'm saying is that you can do a lot with a pretty affordable and like on your own. It was these styrofoam screens that are cut and, and piled up on top of each other, creating multiple screens and then two projectors. Um, and, and it had video on both sides. And then after that, I realized that I would like to have more of these screens and slowly like it's not like every project it's like more it's not at all it's it's different it's not about the, the scale but this is a pretty kind of like the, the most ambitious scale wise because of the initial space I was given um so it, yeah but I think that even also like at a bigger scale, keeping a kind of DIY approach about a lot of the things. When I say DIY, I mean just like being really hands-on and understanding like I don't fabricate, but I want to understand how people fabricate and things like just be, I think that is always kind of like the most fun and like best way to know how your work, work functions. Um, yeah, so I don't know if it answered the question, but yeah, definitely. And I, you know, and thinking about how, you know, in, in showing your iterations that you're responding to the site, to the to the space, to the location, and and kind of also how sometimes limitations can open up possibilities to um, really appreciate you sharing that, especially as an artist who works within the digital realm is and bringing the work into the physical realm. There is definitely like a conversation that happens in between both. And I just really appreciate seeing how that shows up in your work. Thank you. And I'll say this that like for me, the starting point is the video and those are fully made, um, are like 80% have been made um, just by 
like filming with the camera, watching tutorials, learning like which you know like they are a zero budget in a way um, thing. Um, thank you for that. The answer to that question. It's an inspiring question. You can do a lot with a little. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, we have a couple of questions that are sort of related, I think, in terms of asking you to think about futurist themes or science fiction themes. We actually started our series um, and uh, thinking about Afrofuturism. We're actually going to finish the series um, thinking about Afrofuturism. And I think I even used the phrase post-colonial futurism in introducing you or thinking about speculation. I wonder if you could sort of think about your relationship to the speculative world of futurism uh, now, whether you see yourself in relation to that, ship to that, or whether this is just how you go intuitively and people put this name on you. Yes. Yes, I mean, I, I obviously, you know, um, I think I, could, I can't really um, talk about Afrofuturism because that is a very different history, very different like racial history. And it has, it has like origins that, um, are very, you know, as American, I'm, I'm not part of, um, but I do think that um, something that I've been thinking about a lot is the idea of just um, using imagination as kind of like the most rebellious act in terms of representation of a place. Um, you know, there's there's been so much depiction and I speak of like North Africa because that's what I know best or maybe the Arab world as, the depictions are very um, kind of like always the same and have like this like social approach and you know it do documentary and like kind of like idea of like reportage realism of 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 what happening and I think that's like the idea of the luxury of abstraction and, and not being uh, tied to reality in in a way is to me so important so. Um, so, so those are some things that are important to me that, you know, I think in this idea of like post-colonial futurism um, are the center. Uh, there's uh, another question, I think it's from, um, is it from Anika, uh, who's asking about, um, uh, let me just be sure, yeah, it is um, from Anika about whether you ever feel that Americans and Moroccans differently interpret your work or even misinterpret your work. Um, I'll just also say this kind of question came up last Thursday when we had Shireen Nishat who talked about being misinterpreted, um, differently interpreted um, from an Iranian perspective versus a so-called so Western perspective um, and feeling not fully, um, fully understood by either. I don't know if that's a dynamic you see or if it's, um, or because you're making work or making work now at a different time if it's not a dynamic, but anything, any of your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I try not to think just of American and American because then it's never ending. You know, like I already like, everything is like in relation to um, how I position myself in between both. And also have, you know, I was French educated, that's, an, that's another cultural, so I, I do think that it's liberating to think also there's like so many people in between and the reality is everyone is gonna understand my work so differently uh, and maybe that's okay uh, because there isn't one right way of interpreting it. That's why also because it has a core that is about story and it's, um, you know, so I think I, the only thing that bothers me is when it's all reduced to only identity um, because I, hope that I'm offering more than uh, just a display of identity. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's kind of like the most important part. Casey or Edgar, do you see something else or want to pose more? Yeah, I have a question here from Christopher about the media that you work in. Um, and Christopher asks specifically about VR and whether you would consider using VR and as he puts it, allowing others to be a part of your party through their own devices. Um, and I know that you've worked um, in this sort of very spatial site specific installation format, but that you've also produced 
some works for um, distribution on Instagram, for example. So I wonder what your thoughts are about um, using these very distinct media um, for, for your projects. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I haven't been necessarily interested in VR. Just, I think I would do VR if a project that makes complete sense as a VR project um, came to me, you know, but um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm actually not so interested in technology in this way. Um, I do use video, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a, a goal. And I also like think the problem with VR is that I like VR at home, but VR in a museum to me is a strange thing to understand because it's not a, like, I like in a museum, you're just like around people, there's a communal experience. So it's like, I feel like I still haven't just, you know, found the solution to, um, and I, I do think that also VR is so technically like new when it's the first time you do it, that like the tech aspect takes so much space. Um, and it's it's not my, my, what my work has been about kind of. Um, so for that reason, I never have. Um, and then you were saying other technologies or like you said, Instagram or. Yeah, like how you yeah. choose or what you see some of the different, you know, um, affordances of say making something for Instagram, um, right? Which you're watching on, you know, similar to VR, maybe it's a very isolated yeah. experience, right? Looking at yeah. something on your phone versus this big immersive space of the gallery. Yeah, for me, that's the ideal way of showing work. Um, but of course it's not accessible to everyone. So I, that's why there's a single channel version of the videos. Instagram for me is just convenient because that's where most of my community is. So I will share something there, but I don't like the platform for what it is, or it's not, um, I'm not interested in thinking about it in a way, you know, it's just has out of kind of convenience because yes, um, that's just the, the platform I have that I use. Um, but, I, I like to share like news about where show is or something and like, but yeah, it's like, I also like the idea that you can't see everything on the phone because these videos are 30 minutes and are more and I like, yeah. So yeah, I think it's interesting because, you know, I, I do work with special effect and 3D animation and video, but I do really think of myself, like, I don't think of those as like, I have a relationship to technology. There are, I'm, I'm really using these as like tools the same way that someone will like use 3D to make a movie or something. You know, there it's not about the tools themselves. Um, so I often get wrapped up in this like new media technology category. And I have been asked many times about VR and things like that, but it just doesn't make sense. Hasn't made sense to me um, or is, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I, I guess, going along with that, I, I'm just really interested in your, um, the way that you use kind of the language of video in your work and, um, and, and in a way also personally how you resist certain like um, interpretations of your work, especially as someone who mm -hmm. has had like certain identity lenses placed on my work. I really can understand that feeling of wanting to resist and kind of um, use abstraction in a way. So I wanted to see if you could speak a little bit to that. And also if while you're working with the language of video, that's also part of the strategies to try to um, resist some of this, like maybe, um, yeah, collapsing of understanding of, of the project. And also I think um, opening up to understand other, um, political experiences through another lens that sometimes we may be desensitized to or may feel like we have a certain understanding of. Can you say that last part again, please? Yeah, yeah, um, just, I, I guess, kind of also thinking about how resisting like the way that certain political, um, I, I guess, phenomenon get like collapsed mm -hmm. also. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Resist that too. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I see like how the, is like what, what I say about technology, there's a similar attitude. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I just, um, it, it's just kind of like the same approach of trying to not be, to question everything, every decision, right? Like just because something is available like VR or something um, 
is is judged like relevant or time sensitive like why why would i have to go there um unless i need to for what i'm trying to do so it's just really like just have like a guiding principle um it's not um taking pleasure in saying no to an idea or taking pleasure in like being you know just resisting something it's just really like out of because that's that's the best way for me to work that's just what works for me um it's a same simple answer but i think it's just oh definitely that's I what's definitely, in common between both yeah i really appreciate that a guy having like a guiding principle and also you mentioned intuition a lot and that definitely feels like it's a big part of what guides the work i try i mean you know you can't always just like follow intuition so it can be frustrating thing to have hear someone being like just follow intuition or have fun because it's like where do you start but it, i try to go back to those spaces uh, when i can uh, there's a, a question that was posed by eric very early on about um a moment a moment actually when you were presenting um an inst an, an installation of uh the piece you use the word fragmentation to talk about how mm -hmm. the, the, the piece was reorganized as if for the first time in a more fragmented way. And if you want to say a little bit more about what you meant by that, or I don't know who, who, the, who the person is who dances. I don't know if that's an aunt or a, another family member who, who dances and, and ends up dispersed across multiple screens. Did she like that? <laughs> um, how, how you decide, I mean, just the decisions about fragmentation. And I'll actually attach a last question here from um, Sasha Grayson about um, whether or not you might ever be able to imagine a fully spatialized experience on Instagram or whether or not you only have to think in terms of single channel when it comes to sharing things online. Is it, might it be possible ever to think about creating something spatial in, on Instagram or on something else online? Okay, actually those are two really different questions, but... Um, um yeah the fragmentation i meant that because the space was smaller two screens that would be next to each other and form one screen were literally yeah so instead of like having this big wrap around that you can all see from one angle things were separate um in most screens you have the same things going on so there's a effect of multiplication sometimes something else um, is shown. So like, let's say maybe like the main focus is on me talking to you right now. So you would have that on the, on the main screen, maybe on the side screen, you'll have the view outside my window. And if something happens outside my window that informs what I'm telling you, just like the meaning, yeah, something starts happening. Um, it also overwhelms the viewer because you're like, wait, wait I'm, where am I supposed to look? That's what I'm interested in also just like keeping the person active um instagram i you know um again if i could share my work um with the same community without going through instagram that would be amazing i don't i don't want to put any thought towards anything um on instagram but also for me the the idea of the immersion is that it's physically there you're sharing pheromones with people next to you you feel people it's it's, you know, mostly after this year of COVID, I, I really don't love um, the digital space in that way. I like the idea of, for things to be able to be shared like that. And, and if it's, you know, it's not possible to do this installation everywhere, but if it's a single channel that can be projected somewhere, people are, you know, like, I think it's always better. Um, but so I'm kind of like, yeah, I haven't thought about it. Um, but I'm sure someone will, and that would be exciting. Yeah, and you actually just brought up what has been a huge theme, of course, this entire series, which is the COVID, COVID effect of um, how we're taking mm -hmm. media art, how we take in video art, which is both in this, you know, the particular sort of silver lining of the fact that we see so much on screen that ha that has been a sort of boon to video art, that there's a more and more interest in it, and at the same time, more and more clarity about how much we actually would like to be in shared space, proximate space together to view these works. So, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. 
Well, um, if there isn't, I think, um, Casey or Edgar, do you have a last question there? Yeah, I have a last one. And then I think Edgar has, um, there's a great question that's come into the Q&A that we want to ask too. Well, um, right. Yeah, but I'll just ask, this sort of actually follows up on what Shannon just said about the pandemic. Um, it seems to me that this, this piece feels very different now than it did um, uh, you know, over a year ago and, and when you first made it. I mean, on the one hand, the idea of having a party with your family in person feels very different now, um, although still a cause mm -hmm. of celebration, right? Um, but these themes of um, sort of dematerialization or of the self um, communicating through a screen or being filtered through a screen, um, yeah, as well as these themes of globalization and, and movement and lack thereof um, feel um, perhaps even more pressing now, but also different. So I'm wondering if you see this piece differently now, a year later, after quarantining. I didn't think about it. I think because I've seen it so many times for the past three years, um, I almost don't have the distance to think about what it feels like to watch it. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's um, I would have to like not watch it for five years to like be able to see it. Um, but it's it's cool to hear you said that. It makes sense, yeah. I it makes a lot of sense. I have, I have to agree. When we've been to so many Zoom parties that start to leave one feeling, you know, sort of hollow, what might it be that to sort of use your idiom to rethink what it is to have a screen party? <laughs> um, it really, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's interesting, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd love to, um, you know, ask the last question here from um, Megan in the Q and A. And this is a moment for you if you want to fantasize. Um, Megan wants to know who you would want to collaborate or do a residency with, um, with a discipline outside of your own, like for example, biology or teleportation science, literature, journalism. Is there a discipline that you're dreaming of collaging, quote unquote, your practice with? And that's Megan Steinman, so she'll make it happen. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Hi, Seisha, by the way. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think a lot, I, I would like to do a lot of um, collaboration with people from out, outside fields. Um, but maybe before even it's a collaboration, I just, would, there's so many conversations that would be interesting to have with people um, that are specialized in those fields, um, yeah, you, you, teleportation science, Megan um, um, kept someone who works in quantum physics. I just love the idea of, um, there's the information aspect, just like learning things, but I love the ways of, you know, the, the methodologies of other disciplines and what you can learn from someone else's methodology and for your own methodology. Um, you know, when you do a video editing, there's always that word of like workflow, like, where you start and like what the workflow is. And, and I, I do feel like every year, like it sounds cheesy, but I, I develop my, my workflow, like how I, how I approach going from footage to, and I, and I do feel like it would be cool to learn from other people's. Um, and yeah, I always had like, I think the fantasy of like one day maybe talk to a biologist and see what happens. But then, uh, more and more I realized that my, and I, I feel like I've just been saying that a lot. I just love telling stories. So I feel like it wouldn't be a collaboration like some other artists have done, like someone like Anika Yi, who has worked with a lot of biologists where there is actually like a, a biology experiment that is an art piece. So it wouldn't, that sounds really exciting, but I think that in a way it wouldn't take this form of doing, I mean, at least where I, where I am right now, you know? Um, it would be kind of like informing a character or, or story writing. Um, that would be cool. Well, Miriam, uh, the course that we're teaching, which this uh, lecture series sits inside, is a course for students of all different majors, many of them freshmen undeclared, but many who have declared are physics majors, data science majors, engineers, mm -hmm. biologists, as well as anthropology, um, history, economics. Amazing art, the art. So you're already in collaboration, um, um, whether you knew it or not. And I really want to thank you for sharing your time with us, sharing your incredible, your perspective, your 
um, for being so frank and open um, and uh, imaginative, <laughs> even in the course of just our 90 minutes together. It was really, really a special event for us. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me and for all the questions. Yeah. And for yeah. everyone who, who came. Yeah, yeah. Okay, lots of thank yous coming in from the chat. Um, we love to have you at Berkeley when we can be uh, in co-present space. We have a lot I would of love that. working <laughs> who can help you think about teleportation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That would be so cool. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Thank, thank you so everybody. much. Bye. Bye. Bye.